Thank you, Ellie. It's a pleasure to be with you for this breakout session on data use, governance, and protection. This session was organized by Trudy Krauss from the UT Health Center for Healthcare Data, and we've moderated by Lee Spangler. The session is sponsored by Barry Dunn, and I am pleased to welcome Jeff Stoddard from Barry Dunn to give a few remarks. Good afternoon, and welcome to the session, Data Use, Governance and Protection, moderated by Lee Spangler and organized by Trudy Krauss of UT Health. My name is Jeff Stoddard, and I am the co-leader of the data management and strategy practice within the health analytics practice group at Barry Dunn. We work with state governments and not-for-profit organizations to provide data management, analytics, health policy, and actuarial services. We're pleased to be a sponsor of this session and look forward to connecting over the course of the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Barry Dunn, again for sponsoring us. It's now my pleasure to introduce Lee Spangler, today's moderator. Lee, uh, the stage is all yours. Go ahead and... Thank you very much and uh, good day, everyone, and uh, welcome once again. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce this extraordinary uh, panel of experts, and I look forward to uh, what they have to share about data use, governance, and protection, uh, all based on their education and expertise. It's often said, uh, it's not what you say, but how you say it. And when it comes to large resources of patient data, it's not about the APCD or the database, the what, uh, but often it's about the how, how the appropriate research can be undertaken and how information is properly shared and accessed. Um, before I begin, I'd like to also once again, encourage you to, um, utilize the chat feature for any questions you may have. I'll make sure that we'll get to those uh, before the end of the, of the session. Um, and with that said, uh, I'd like to introduce our first presenters. Uh, Dr. Amy Hahn Nelson is a research faculty at the University of Pennsylvania and director of training and technical assistance for actionable intelligence for social policy. Ms. Jessie Tenenbaum, serves as the Chief Data Officer for the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, assisting the department in developing uh, strategies on the use of information to inform and evaluate policy and improve the health and well-being of the residents of North Carolina. Um, I'd like to now turn it over to their presentation. Hello. Thank you for being here today and thanks to the organizers for giving us a chance to present on the work we've done in co-creating enterprise data governance and making data sharing less painful. I'm Jesse Tenenbaum from North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, joined by Amy Han Nelson from the Actionable Intelligence for Social Policy. Next slide. Uh, so we actually presented our work here two years ago to tell you what we were going to try to do, and now we're here to tell you how it's going. The bottom line is it has been a slog, not surprisingly, but we are making progress. Uh, so we'll tell you a little bit about that. So first, just serves some motivation. Why do we want to focus on standardizing this process? It benefits many different stakeholders here. It benefits the people of North Carolina, um, where data integration supports holistic insights so we can provide better service and have better outcomes mitigates risk for DHHS. Um, previously, we've either had data lockdown or risk of data being too openly shared. Both of these approaches have their risks, and so we're trying to mitigate both of those. Um, and then for supporting staff, data access is a pain point. Staff just want to get the data they need to do their job and don't want to spend a lot of time dealing with the logistics and hoops to jump through to get that data. Uh, so back in 2019, uh, my office, the data office, was created at DHHS. We staffed up, we developed a data strategy, um, and we engaged the consultation of uh, Dr. Han Nelson, um, began doing the landscape survey with qualitative interviews, um, figured out key steps to improve data access and what needed to happen. And then by last year, we were able to publish our data sharing guidebook, um, along with a data for request form that has served as the basis for many of the requests we're getting now, and importantly, a legal framework to make all of this flow more smoothly. So now we're finally getting into the action of it. In November of last year, we executed our interdepartmental MOU. 
Um, this year, a lot of the work early in the year was spent drafting our data sharing agreements with the different divisions, documenting what they what data assets they brought to the table and what the rules were around those use, and then executing those agreements. Um, and now we're uh, working on this, actually having a day to day helping us out, um, doing some ongoing iterative improvement, but really demonstrating use cases of how this has helped all across the department. So the note here is that the data sharing guidebook uh, we've developed is available publicly. Here's the URL um, and by all means, check it out and hopefully it'll be useful for other states and organizations dealing with the same issues. Great, thanks, Jesse. So the data sharing guidebook is, um, it is a, it is a guidebook, right? It's a choose your own adventure kind of thing, but it includes some real basics for um, data access and use for the department. So there are priorities in there. There's um, important roles that are defined. We talk through terms and what they mean. Like, what do we mean when we say high value data asset? Um, we talk about different request process processes for different pathways. You know, there are different reasons to request data and the reason depends on the legality, right? So um, this kind of walks through everything um, and we we hope that it's successful and we hope you, you check it out. Um, the one thing that we're still working on, we have some of it in our, our guidebook is you know, metadata. Uh, metadata is key for ethical use. And this is a place that we're still working. Um, maybe this will be our, our NATO 2023 presentation. Um, so just know more to come on this. Um, we do have some metadata. It is limited and insufficient, um, <laughs> but it is better than what we had. Uh, we have lots of process. We have many forms. We have roles defined. And most importantly, we have improved data flow. So these are our what we determine our foundational agreements. So we have our most important agreement is the kind of the rules of the sandbox agreement. This is our IMOU. This is the overarching document that explains how data is used within DHHS. We then have data sharing agreements. These are division and office specific. They are um, all different. Uh, we use a template, but then the template is modified depending on what federal and state laws are needed, um, as well as the data that is held. Um, then we have the data use agreement. This isn't used every time data is accessed um, because a lot of that access is governed by the data sharing agreement, but there are places where a data use agreement is necessary um, and helpful. So when needed, we have templates for that as well. And we have we actually have two different templates that we use for our data use agreement. So these are just a couple different ways to think about the relationship here. Um, it, it is a flexible legal framework because the use needs to be flexible, right? Um, there's a lot of different ways that data is coming in and out of DHHS. Um, so here's one example. Here you see the data use agreement is directly with the data office who holds the, the IMOU. Um, here's another one where there's a data use agreement that is between two divisions, but then there's also a line to the, to the data office and to the overarching department. Um, and then another. So, so again, flexible use depending on the type of data and how it's used. Right, Jesse. As mentioned, we are already seeing the fruit of our labors here. Um, benefits of this framework are that it clarifies guidelines, just even knowing who is required to sign to say, yes, you can use this data. Um, it provides language and templates to mitigate risk and save time in the development. Um, saves time from both the business and the legal team, often by not requiring an additional document. And then it gets data and insights to the program faster so that they can act upon it and use data-driven policy. Um, so on the right, just showing the amount of time saved, the first is in hours, we've seen an 80 to 90% reduction in the number of hours required by business and legal together. And then from end to end on the right, the time to complete in months here too, we've seen a really significant decrease in the time required. Next slide. So some key points from the work we've done, the framework is flexible, it has to be, there's lots of legal gotchas. And so you need to be able to account for those in special cases. Importantly, legal was brought in from the very beginning. Um, they have been helping and involved in the process at all times. It doesn't take them out of the process. It just provides a clear process around which for them to weigh in and help out. Um, and ideally to do less of that when it's not needed. Data owners still have full control over the use of their data. So this is not relinquishing um, 
ownership. This is not relinquishing control. It's all documented in these uh, data sharing agreements that you can then refer back to and not have to re the reinvent the wheel each time. And then also pointing out that our data office serves as a shepherd or midwife or whatever metaphor works for you. Um, we are not the decision makers. We help with process and support to get the people, to get staff the data they need to do their jobs. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed yeah, the presentation. Yeah, and just one more note. So if you want to learn more about this legal framework, um, this is a new report that we just published uh, last month at AISP. It's around um, finding a way forward, how to create a strong legal framework for data integration. Um, some of the work of DHHS is featured in this report, and we also give more details and explanation on kind of the approach and the way that it works. So more information there in that hyperlink. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, um, please reach out our email. Our emails are there and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Well, um, you uh, you mentioned uh, that it was a slog uh, to get through, but then your presentation made it seem so easy. Um, would you all like to share maybe uh, one thing that um, you would do differently uh, now that you've uh, been through uh, what you've been through? Uh, sure, I'll grab that one. So something that's come up recently, we we had lots of engagement at the beginning and Amy did a lot of the qualitative assessment and interviewed lots of people and we had lots of meetings and filled people in. But as COVID hit and as we got busy with focusing on what we were doing, um, it turned out there were a few key stakeholders that we forgot to kind of fill in and there was changeover in the department. So we had people leave and other people come in and we didn't necessarily um fill in the new people and so we've had some meetings recently where they've said wait what <laughs> and they said but you guys were involved the whole time and we didn't do as good a job so given high turnover rates you can have at government institutions just remember that and keep people on board and informed all the way through and then is there anything that uh, so the texas apcd is pretty pretty new uh, so I'm always looking for tips. So is there anything um, that you would consider uh, essential or something that you would absolutely do the same way? Amy, you want to take it? There's a bunch of things I would do the same way. <laughs> yeah. in, in order of priority, I'll take notes. <laughs> Yeah, so I think the, the key thing is that we kept legal centered. It can be real. Um, I don't want to say easy, but it can. It's a common approach to bring in legal at the very end, and we knew that wasn't the right way. And so from day one, we we got legal at the table. Every you know, legal's big, right? That's a big entity. So got them at the table and really communicated every step. Um, the other thing we did was we really focused on collaborative editing. So while you know a lot of a lot of the guidebook was written down on a screen by me every single page was reviewed by dozens and dozens of people um and it, there was a very careful review process that was very methodical it, it was you know it took six months just to review um and that was something that we did right um in hindsight and it's also been helpful for us to have kind of the trail of that review because we've had pe like as people change positions and we have new people on board they'll say why did you do that and i'm like well actually I have the email that explains exactly why we made the decisions we made. And also this is never in final draft. So we would love to update it. Um, and so that's been a really important part of the process is the constant refinement. Well, well other, thank you. Oh, go ahead. One thing I would add to that, and this is a little bit of patting myself on the back, but um, it's, it's very um, abstract concepts. And I myself and a lot of our staff have trouble wrapping our heads around it. And we came up with a very useful metaphor at one point that was sort of like a imagine you're you decide with a bunch of friends to room together in a house and like this document is the equivalent of this and this document is the equivalent of that and that helps make it much more concrete to people when you're versus saying a dua and a moa and a letters that mean different things to different people um so putting it in concrete terms like that and using analogies i think was really helpful to get people to understand what you're trying to do and why well, thank you very much. And we will bring you back at the end. But uh, uh, with that, I'd like to move on to our, our next presentation. 
Um, next, you're going to hear from Ms. Evren Page. Uh, Evren is the Director of Science and IRB for the Oklahoma State Department of Health. She's responsible for overseeing uh, the OSDH data governance. She has a master's in public health with a concentration in epidemiology. So with that, I'll turn it over to Evren. Hello, my name is Evren Page, and I'm the Director of Science and IRB for the Oklahoma State Department of Health. I also oversee our data governance program. Today, I will be talking with you about the creation of our Data Use Review Committee, which was formed to process external data requests. Prior to the creation of this committee, the Oklahoma State Department of Health lacked an agency-wide process for responding to and fulfilling data requests. This led to general confusion and a cumbersome process which placed undue burden on requesters and OSDH. Furthermore, this lack of process posed a potential risk for the release of data without appropriate protection measures in place. DIRK was created to address these issues and respond to changing regulations pertaining to institutional review board practices. Our previous process varied by program area with no standard application form. Data use agreements were unique to each program area, which created a burden for both the program and our legal department. We also lacked standards for data transportation. This lack of a standard agency approach created confusion for requesters. As an agency, we were unable to track data releases, publications, or the destruction of our data. There was also a lack of transparency on how requests were approved, who had access, and how data was being used. Lastly, while the Office for Human Research Protections has provided guidance that releasing data does not constitute engagement in research, our Commissioner of Health had previously required that all data requests were subject to OSDH IRB oversight. This was a significant burden for the OSDH IRB, as well as requesters, who then had to maintain multiple IRB approvals. As the last step, the Commissioner of Health had to sign off on all requests under our previous process. Now that I've explained a little about how we previously handled data requests, I'm going to provide you with an overview of our current process. First, the requester contacts the program area and completes the initial application. The program area reviews the application to ensure that the data is capable of supporting the research objectives. Requesters are strongly encouraged to discuss the planned project with the program area prior to completing the application. If the application is acceptable to the program area, they submit it to the Data Governance Manager. If no issues are identified by the Data Governance Manager, the application is included on the next DIRC agenda. Program area data stewards attend the DIRC meetings to answer any questions raised by the committee. Following discussion, DIRC members vote to approve, deny, or table the application. Once DIRC has approved the application, the Data Governance Manager drafts a data use or data sharing agreement. The DUA or DSA is then routed for review and signatures. If changes to the agreement are requested, the changes must be approved by our legal department. Once the agreement has been finalized and all signatures are in place, the Data Governance Manager authorizes the program area to release the requested data using the agreed upon data transport plan. In order to maintain approval, requesters are required to submit annual usage updates and provide OSDH notice of any upcoming publications. Some projects require that requesters obtain approval for intended publications. Once the project is completed, they are required to follow procedures outlined in the agreement for destroying the data and provide certification of data destruction. If project changes are needed, requesters must submit a modification request and obtain approval prior to implementation of any changes or the release of additional data. Some modifications will require an addendum to the DUA or DSA. The OSDH data use application covers a variety of components. These include information about the requester, their institution, and a list of individuals that will have access to the data. Only individuals listed on the application will be authorized to access or work with the data. Individuals not listed may be added by submitting a modification request. The application form also includes information regarding the study design and how the data will be used. It covers questions regarding security measures, controls, and how OSDH data will be protected. As part of the application, requesters must provide a list of requested variables with specific justifications for each variable and how it will be used. If the requester cannot provide strong justification as to why a variable is needed, then it will not be provided. They also need to specify the format that is needed for each variable. 
Whenever possible, Dirk attempts to provide categorical variables in order to reduce the potential for re-identification. For example, age groupings are frequently provided in lieu of exact ages or birth dates, unless the requester can provide strong justification as to why more exact data is needed. In addition to the application itself, requesters are required to provide proof of IRB approval from their home institution or a determination that IRB approval was not required. They also need to obtain OSDH IRB excusal or a reliance agreement. Lastly, although not required, they are requested to provide any other applicable supporting documentation, such as the study protocol, letters of support, or grant information. If the application is incomplete, it will be tabled until the requester submits the missing information. Now I'd like to talk with you about what Dirk has achieved. The first step was to form the committee which began holding meetings in July of 2018. We also hired a data governance manager, which was a new position for our organization. In addition to the data governance manager, Dirk includes the IRB administrator, our privacy officer, an attorney, and selected program area directors. Data stewards attend as guests. Once Dirk was established, the application form and process were developed. As part of this process, we also established procedures for maintaining oversight for the entire life cycle of the requested data. Since Dirk was formed, OSDH has approved 38 data requests. We also developed DUA and DSA templates. In order to ensure broad acceptance of the terms of the agreement that satisfy applicable state and federal laws, as well as organizational policies and procedures, the templates were vetted and approved by our most frequent requesting institution. Language in the template may be changed if agreed upon by all parties. As part of the agreement template, we also developed a standard data transport plan, which is employed when data requests are fulfilled. Having standard DUAs and DSAs provides OSDH with a means to enforce adequate data security measures and suppression rules for publications, while also protecting our organization from liability. Both the creation of the application process and agreement templates have greatly reduced the burden on our IRB legal department, program areas, and requesters. At the time of this report, 28 projects have been excused from further OSDH IRB oversight, thereby eliminating the need for requesters to maintain approval with multiple IRBs. The program areas and legal are also saving time as they are no longer drafting unique agreements for each request. Personally, I am most excited about this program's ability to improve transparency on tracking data requests tracking publications, and establishing a standard practice that balance our duty to protect an individual's right to privacy while also ensuring researchers have access to the data needed to advance public health research and practice. Despite these achievements, additional improvements are still needed. The current process is lengthy and turnaround time between request and fulfillment needs to be reduced. Even with the use of the DSA template, agreements are sometimes subject to multiple legal reviews, which are lengthy under the best of circumstances. While I do not anticipate being able to reduce the time for legal review, we hope to identify efficiencies in other areas of the process to reduce the total turnaround time. This may include adjustments to the process flow. We also need to make improvements to the application form, as requesters often do not adequately address all of the areas of the application. Improvements to the form itself may improve the requester's experience and reduce turnaround time as incomplete applications must be edited and resubmitted. We also need to develop a variable request template. Currently, we do not have one as each request is so unique that it's been challenging to come up with a format that would work for all requesters. Unfortunately, however, requesters often miss instructions in the application regarding how to submit this list. Many applications have been received without an attached variable list. Other times, requesters will submit a copy of the provided data schema and will indicate that they want everything. As part of our approval process, Dirk strives to approve the minimum amount of data necessary to support the research goals, and requesting all of the available variables is not acceptable. A variable request template, along with improvements to the application form, would help to address these issues and assist in reducing turnaround time. While we still have areas for improvement, overall this program has been successful in reducing burden for the agency and ensuring better oversight and protection of our data, while allowing requesters with access to needed data to support ongoing public health research. At this time, I would like to thank our Dirk members, especially Brandon Westbury and Dr. Derek Pate. Thank you for your attention, and I hope that you found this presentation beneficial. Well, thank you very much. I, I do have a question in regard to um, what was there, this uh, focused, uh, it was a very internally focused process. Did you reach out to any um, stakeholders or researchers or others 
uh, in the developing development of your internal process for for review mm -hmm. of these requests? Yes, we did. So. Um, Unfortunately, we kind of ran into uh, some issues before the committee was formed that really drove the need to have the committee in place. Um, and until we were able to establish the process, we basically stopped sharing data with anyone who wanted it. And so we actually had several researchers who waited a very long time um, while we tried to um, develop the templates and establish the process. Um, our most frequent uh, requester is the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, um, which is just, uh, at the time we've moved buildings, but at the time they're on campus with our health department. So we worked with um, some of the researchers from the College of Public Health, um, and then also of course their legal department to develop that template. Um, and we also referred to um, different, data use applications from other health departments, as well as the CDC and kind of reviewing those applications to develop our own. Thank you very much. I do appreciate it. And we'll, we will bring you back later for the, for the full panel Q and A. Thank you, Evren. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, fi finally, um, we're going to hear from um, uh, Ms. Stacy Schiller. Uh, she serves as the Director of External Affairs for the Delaware Health Information Network, overseeing the marketing, advertising, and brand reputation for the entity. And uh, Mr. Mike O'Neill. Mike is an IT industry leader. He's a founder and chairman of the board of the Open Source Electronic Health Record Alliance and CEO of Medicasoft. Um, I, we're going to hear them discuss um, privacy consent and 42 CFR part two, substance abuse information. So with that, I'll turn it over to our presenters. Okay, well, Stacy Schiller and I will take you through data use, governance and protections, and talk a little bit about the importance of privacy, uh, consent and sensitive data in the world of health information exchange. We'll walk you through a little bit of why this has become such an important topic these days. Uh, a few words about the architecture and the technology that's required to support it. And then we'll get an interesting update on the implementation in Delaware. So first, why has such a, a focus started on patient consent and health information data? Well, first of all, just more health records are being exchanged these days. There are more technology uh, options, national networks and support from provider software such as their EHRs and so forth that just make it easier for organizations to exchange health information. Uh, there's also regulatory assistance. The, the government has encouraged the provider community for a number of years to exchange health records and has recently started to encourage the payer community to make health data available and implement more health information exchange. Uh, there are more use cases. Uh, traditionally, the, the reason to exchange health records was for treatment, for healthcare providers to provide better treatment, to have more complete health records on their patients. Increasingly, though, the payer community has found more use for uh, clinical data and health records in non-treatment purposes of use. In all of this, it's, it's all for very good reason. There are tangible patient benefits for increased health record exchange, whether it's just better records providing better outcomes or more efficiency in claims processing and prior authorization and care coordination. It's important for us to know though, that even though there are patient benefits to health information exchange, there is a requirement to make sure that patients stay at the center and their preferences for sharing their data are honored. When we think about the, the ecosystem that involves patient consent, health information exchanges such as, as DIN in Delaware are really the perfect ecosystem. All of the stakeholders that I mentioned are present there. Healthcare providers are a source of data to the HIE. They're also a user of that aggregated data the payer community increasingly is working with HIEs to access aggregated data. 
government plays a role both, both as a source and a consumer of data, and patients have the ability to interact directly with the HIE, particularly in the, the Delaware instance, to indicate their preferences. And in fact, let me turn it over here to Stacy to talk a little bit more about the HIE environment. Thanks, Mike. So here in Delaware, Delaware's Health Information Network functions really as the central nervous system in the healthcare ecosystem. And while we do partner with all of these different stakeholders, what's most important is for us to remember that patients are at the center of it. Patients own their health data and they need to be able to access it. And so here at DIN, one of the things that we stood up is a personal health record. And we partnered with our friends at MedicaSoft to launch this. And now we have taken it one step further to establish a consent registry for patients. So next slide, please, Mike. So when we talk about consent at the patient level, we're really talking about three different types of consent. We have the basic consent, which is HIPAA compliance sharing. So treatment, payment, operations, public health purposes. For HIEs like DIN, typically an opt-in or an opt-out consent model is used. In our case, we have an opt-out model and we're proud to say that over 15 years and 3 million patients later, we've only had 57 opt out. So patients see the value in health information exchange. So taking it down a level, sensitive consent. So this is exactly what it implies. HIV test results, reproductive information, behavioral health, genetic testing, this type of sensitive content is something that patients want to have some measure of control over. And so with sensitive consent, we're looking at an option to share your basic data, but being selective when sensitive data is being viewed. And then the further step down from that is part two consent. And this is substance use disorder data. This requires, thanks to the federal regulation, a very specific written consent that also delineates that it can't be redisclosed without patient consent again. So with part two consent, it's imperative that there is a consent tool that is able to really drill down to the specifics to meet the obligation and the spirit of this regulation. And so all of these levels of consent come together and meet at the point of protecting patient consent, giving patient the, a patient the option to, to say how his, her, or their data is being used, but also to protecting that very urgent need for data interoperability. Our CEO, Dr. Jan Lee, who is a family practice physician by training, says very emphatically, data silos kill people. And we want to be sure as a health information exchange that we are supporting the exchange of information while also honoring the patient's wishes. Next slide, Mike. Great, thanks, Stacey. So we wanted to say just a few words about some technology and, and actually an enterprise architecture that allows you to implement the kind of consent management that Stacey spoke of. You can look at this from a few different points of view. First, patients have to have the ability to provide their preferences. What do they want to share with whom and when? And so you can uh, develop a series of applications that give patients that ability to do it directly. In Delaware, DIN has implemented a personal health record that allows patients to do this. Providers can also submit preferences on behalf of patients. The applications that the provider and payer community use to access data need to have the ability to apply consent rules. And in order to apply them, they need a place to retrieve them or to understand what the rules are. And in Delaware, we've taken an approach to use a central standards-based platform. It's actually based on the HL7 FIRE standard to store patient consent along with all of the other critical data that the DIN HIE manages. In this way, patients are able to update it at their convenience and any time that an application or a user accesses the data, the consent rules are right there to be applied to make sure only the correct people see the correct data. 
with that, I'd like to turn it back to Stacy to talk about the implementation that's in progress in Delaware. So quickly, Mike, as you well know, being involved from the MedicaSoft end, the first phase of this implementation was what we're calling a, a you know, sort of a two part, part blunt instrument. So we were not able to get too specific with the first phase of our rollout. So it was essentially an all or none permission to disclose part two, which is substance use disorder data to quote all providers in my care. So it was yes or no. The second phase is what we're most excited about. This is granular consent, and this went into production earlier this year. This is where sharing is specified at the provider and or practice level for that SUD data. So again, getting back to the patient's wishes to make this information available just to those providers who need it for the provision of care. And so we have the tool, we have the data, we are working with Delaware's Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health to facilitate obtaining patient consent to disclose um, the data. And we are looking for other partners who are interested in providing this tool as a patient consent um, operation. And so we're very excited to see granular consent really come to life in this tool here in Delaware. And we're grateful for our partnership with MedicaSoft that allowed us to, to build this. So great things are to come. Great. Thanks, Stacey, for sharing that update on DIN's implementation. Well, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I do have a, a, a question, and, may, and, and I don't think I missed it, but I want to make sure that the, the part two consent and the reason uh, I think why it's so important for you to, to be granular in the consent. Um, uh, the part two consent, does it, ha it has to be separate, right? Or can it be combined with other consents? Doesn't it have to be, when you're talking about substance abuse, be pretty 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 much out there uh, so it alerts the person as to what they're doing yes and and so without going into a ton of detail because i am not an attorney and our general counsel will be happy to talk about this all day long the the sending organization does have the responsibility under part two to um identify which is part two data and which is not and so it's not incumbent on us as the health information exchange to parse that it's incumbent upon the, the sending entity. And I think everybody who's watching can appreciate how um, complicated these standards can be. And, and you, know, you really do need to check with your own legal counsel as it relates to how much responsibility your particular organization may have with this kind of data. But yes, Lee, um, it, it, is, it is something that needs to be specified and does stand alone from the other data. Sure, and I, from the technology point of view, to support the approach that Stacy just mentioned, uh, the, from the from the technology point of view, you can think in one sense, all consent is you know on the same level, if you will. Uh, everything from the very gross level opt in or opt out of sharing any data at all or none, all the way down to really fine grained like I will share this information with this doctor for this week, that kind of thing. Uh, the technology can can give you that kind of flexibility, making it work in a way that doesn't confuse patients, doesn't confuse the users of the data. That's really the trick. And in making it something that's convenient to use, you have to watch out for the rules that, that Stacy mentioned. So you do have to make sure that you're getting uh, explicit consent to share part two data, and then you, that you have the ability to apply that to all the data that it should be applied to. Sometimes even if patients don't quite understand the details, they need to be able to say, I do or don't want to be able to share that type of part two data and trust that the technology will support it and, and not let something slip through the cracks. And, and, and if I can offer a comment there, uh, trust is what it's all about. It's why you've got these processes in place. Uh, so, well, thank you very much. I want to kind of bring the, the full group together if I can, excellent. There we are. And um, first, before I kind of throw out a few questions that we've received through the chat, the first question I want to answer is, 
uh, yes, we are working on making sure the slide presentations are available to everybody. We're going to make them a, an attachment uh, to this session, uh, but you will certainly uh, have access to the recording of the session. So uh, even if it means you've got to take a few notes rather than print it out, we're going to make sure the information uh, is in your hands. Um, but um, let me go a little bit back to the beginning. We received a chat uh, chat question very early on during uh, Dr. Nelson's and, and, and Jesse's um, uh, uh, presentation. Uh, basically, the question is, what, what has been the bi biggest barrier to getting to where you are right now? And how did you overcome it? Um, it sounds like without, and I'm going to add a caveat to that, you're not allowed to say COVID. So. <laughs> I think we'd say the opposite. I think COVID actually fast-tracked a lot of work. Um, yeah, Jesse, do you want to jump in? Um, shoot, I had a good answer just a second ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think inertia and turnover. So um, I, I joked to someone the other day, I'm in my fourth year of a two-year stint with the state. And it, you know, working with Amy has been great. And if I had left, uh, Amy has said this many times, like it would just stop. And so, and we've already, we've been through like three data governance specialist people. So that's challenging. Um, yeah, that's a huge part of it. Uh, I think also executive leadership in our case, we've had strong support at the highest levels, but if we didn't, that would be hugely problematic. Uh, Everin, for your project, what, what would you say your biggest uh, barrier was and how did you overcome that? other than maybe identifying the many problems? <laughs> um, so uh, really, honestly, I think the biggest challenge for us is, is the turnaround time. You know, it's, it can be very frustrating. There are a lot of pieces that are beyond my control. Um, but then at the same time, the requesters are, you know, where's my data? Where's my data? And it's like, well, you know, you were supposed to, sub I told you a month ago, I needed you to submit new documentation and you, you spent three weeks before you got back to me and now you want it like that. So just kind of dealing with those things that it's a lot of hurry up and wait. Um, but we, we do want to help people access the data so research can be done. I mean, what good is the data if we're not using it? So, right. um, yeah. And uh, Mike and Stacy, uh, uh, same question to you all. I, I think Stacy may have already touched on what <laughs> what I think the biggest challenge is, which is making sure that policy and I might even say workflow uh, is integrated into the technology yes. approach. Um, it's one thing, and I speak as a, actually a, a data platform technology company. It's one thing to put that technology together. It's altogether another to make sure that your stakeholders can use it easily and that you've steered you know, down the, the lane that's required by policy, which actually, uh, I, I should let, let Stacy comment here. It's a real expertise of Stacy and her team at DIN to make sure that all this technology works great for their stakeholders. Thanks, Mike. I, just to add to that, I think to your point that all of the technology in the world and all of the improvements we can make don't do us any good if the clinicians or the patients can't make it work. And for us, we saw a real opportunity to leverage the infrastructure of our personal health record, which we already knew thanks to COVID, people were using and getting information they needed from, that this was the ideal place to house um, our, our consent registry. And we worked with Mike's team to make sure, and our legal team, to make sure that we were asking questions and educating users in a way that they would very clearly understand what they were consenting to and what they weren't. And being able to put that into layperson language is really important when you're talking about people's personal information. Um, we received a question. What are your training programs to educate the consumer on how important this is to healthcare data delivery? Do you have a particular patient outreach or consumer outreach? 
Well, if that's a question for me, I'm happy to talk about yeah, it. Yes, it, long, yes, it I is. Yes, I believe, I believe it is. It came in from the chat. Well, here's what I would say. As a health information exchange, I'll be honest, consumers are not our number one audience. And the reason for that is because health information exchanges really are the behind the scenes data movers. So we expect that our consumers, our patients, are, of course, working with their clinicians and their providers of care. And those are the trusted voices that they listen to. What we want to be sure we're doing is providing clinicians and providing consumers with the data. And so we have not traditionally had a strong direct to consumer relationship, as we say in the advertising world. But what we have found is that by building a tool that we were able to promote putting out through various channels and getting the buy-in, honestly, of our um, Delaware Division of Public Health in helping um, using that tool during the pandemic, we were able to establish a relationship of trust to a point with patients. And as such, when now that we have this consent registry integrated in that tool, there is again, a real need for folks to to be trusting, to understand what they're consenting to. And we felt that we really made some progress um, by launching this personal health record and then by adding this next phase. So I'll sum it up to say, I would love it if we had a stronger direct to consumer relationship, but I think the nature of HIEs is such that that's generally not going to be the case. So we educate through our own channels, but we also really make sure to leverage our partners' relationships with patients and and customers to make sure that they're hearing from us as well. All right, and then our last question, and and I don't know uh, whether or not we'll be able to to answer it or not. The question is, what happens? And this is going to be for Mike and Stacy. What <laughs> happens if the consent and or notice of redisclosure is not provided to the authorized recipient? And then is that recipient subject to part two? In other words, do the duties kind of flow to the next provider, I guess is the way to put it. And thank you. Thank you for putting that up. So yes, they do. Um, if, if I'm understanding your use case, if, for example, um, in, the, in the DIN case, uh, a hospital system is getting data from, uh, from DIN let's say via their uh, community health record, which allows a clinician to log in and see uh, the longitudinal record, all the clinical data that uh, that DIN has on that patient. If there's part two data uh, there, we've been talking about, Stacy and I've been talking about here, how do we make sure that you only show the data that you should to that provider? But for the, once you've disclosed, once you've shared that data, that provider is under the same kind of uh, uh, restrictions or, or regulations to use that, use it appropriately. So most typically that's for direct patient care, not for some other, let's say population health or analytics type of purpose. And then they have to protect from further disclosure. Uh, Normally in the workflows that we're normally talking about, this is done, it's relatively straightforward to to do. A clinician is accessing um, a portal to view health records They view the data that they're supposed to. They don't view the data that they're not supposed to. They deliver care and then ends the episode. But if they were to say, hey, I'm going to go, I'm now going to forward your records to, let's say, a specialist that I recommend to you, those restrictions apply. They they should not be sharing data that they uh, don't have consent to share. And I would just well, add to that that the whole goal here is that there being you know sort of no wrong door that no matter where a patient comes into the 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 provision of care that clinicians and others associated with that patient's care and data are all following the same procedures around protecting it. Well, th- that thank you very much. And um, I'm sure everyone who sent in their questions in, in the chat are, are happy with the responses. I don't see any further chat questions, but uh, let me just say, uh, uh, I learned quite a bit, uh, and I'm sure everyone else did, and uh, I'm flattered uh, to be moderating this panel. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope you all have a good rest of your, of your day. We're not quite across the country. We're not quite all in the afternoon. So. Have a good day, depending on where you are.
Thank you. Thanks, Lee, and thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for, for all of those who attended and participated today, and especially those who provided and answered our questions. We have a break coming up. Let's tell you what's coming up during the break. Uh, this is our sponsor booth break, so we want to make sure that everybody has a chance to visit the sponsor booths during this break. We will be back at 40 minutes past the hour, whatever time zone you're in. It'll, it's still 40 minutes past the hour because I don't think we have any of those half hour time zones in, in our audience today. But again, thank you. And, and I do really your your willingness to share this with other people because I know this is a common question that we get at NOTO and the APCD Council about how to make this um, ready to go. So that... Uh, do, do we want to, we, I think we have time for this kind of light, late breaking question, if that's all right. Uh, we do have a Mike, at Lee, if that's okay, a uh, question for Stacey, sure. Mike. Do you, do you use any kind of consent ontology, which machine readable and enforced through technology? Let's, let's, let's go ahead and answer that here. I think we might as well use the time. And, and you know, I'm going to pump that one all Mike. That means, I... <laughs> <laughs> Mike is our expert on that. <laughs> if we, uh, I, there's, there's, I think, two areas that I think maybe we're, we're uh, talking about here. One is in, in capturing consent from the patient. Um, it, and so if, if I'm understanding the question, we actually try to take, uh, I don't know if guesswork is the right, uh, that try, let's say translation out of the equation by actually presenting uh, the equivalent of a, of a form to the patient that makes it very clear for them to say, yes, I'm going to share this or no, I don't. If, that, if that's what you mean to take. Um, uh, it, it's a great question as, as we get more towards granular consent that we mentioned here, because to do the things that I, I briefly mentioned, you can imagine a, a patient saying, I'll share with everybody, but not that doctor ever again. Okay, how does that translate into technical rules that you can store in a consent registry and apply? Um, if, if that's what we mean, we're not quite there yet. We, what we do is we give the patient uh, a, a, the equivalent of kind of checkbox forms that specify consent. So there's no room for translation or needing to use an ontology and say, well, let me take that response and translate it into to, to something different. Um, so I'm not sure if that, that was where the question was directed. The other place that often we think of applying uh, a terminology service or ontology is when we store the consent. Are we storing it in, in a standard form? And there is a mapping to how consent is represented uh, in the implementation that Stacy and I spoke about into uh, the HL7 FIRE standard. Uh, FIRE has a consent resource is the term that, that the standard uses. And so you can specify uh, any level of granularity, as long as you, um, as long as you translate it, let's say, to the the uh, descriptive language that the fire standard uses. Thank you. That question came from me, so I appreciate it. I might still follow up with you guys. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> Evan, I had a question for you. If we've okay. got a few Does any minutes. <laughs> Yeah. Is that all right if we panel yep. discussion? Go ahead. Um, Evren, the, um, yes. the jerk in the meetings you mentioned, it sounded like uh, the different groups get together and review the requests for data. And I was curious how frequently those happen and if that slows the process down in any way. And if you've considered maybe speeding it up by having kind of only the relevant data owner types reviewing it. So, um, Currently, we meet once a month. Um, honestly, I would love if we could meet maybe like once every two weeks, but getting all of those people to the table even once a month, we sometimes struggle to achieve quorum. Um, and I definitely, things probably would be speedier if it was just kind of limited to um, individuals who actually are related to that data, but that's kind of, our old process where the program areas were the ones that were just approving requests when they received them. And then like leadership and the agency as a whole didn't have that visibility on what was being approved. Um, and so it's like, well, if we only limit it to those that are related, then it kind of goes back to this old method where um, how requests are getting done is not or approved isn't as consistent um, across the agency. 
Um, and we want to make sure that, you know, sometimes people that are don't have a vested into interest in the data or the project may see something wrong or see something that's concerning that someone closer to it might not. But um, it is something to consider. Maybe there's a way that I can kind of merge those two to um, make things more efficient. So I, I'm definitely interested in any sort of options there. Maybe we could follow up on as well. Cause it's so maybe I've gotten a sense from uh, Amy's and my approach that it's it's more decentralized in the, the data owners. And please say hi to Fincher. Or whoever's visiting yes, you. I saw her sneaking in in the background. I mean, it's, 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 uh, oh, sorry, it's an early release day from school. Oh, uh, no, I, yeah, I understand. Life COVID. Yes, uh, exactly. But yeah, I would love to connect um, some other time and maybe we can um, learn from each other to. Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any last any last thoughts? There, there's Norm. <laughs> if if anybody has anything, two minutes left. So now's your chance. All right. Well, thank you all. I don't see anybody jump. Thank you, Lee. Um, thank you for for organizing this session and for participating. I'm going to put this on my list of must see sessions. For anybody who is developing an APCD or any other data project, this has been very helpful and tackle some of these difficult questions that everybody has and most people are afraid to ask because they don't want to. So, thank you for doing that and we will see everybody at 40 past the hour for our next session and hopefully you enjoy the sponsor booths. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>